I read the literature saying, uh, do you have a burning story to tell? I realized that I didn't really. I thought TMI was just about on something else. I, I don't know. So I was, I was floored, and that was my first experience with TMI. I'm a good writer, I'm a good speaker, a good, but I, I, I don't really like to get up in front of people or, or um, write essays, memoirs, whatever, but um, I know I'm good at that, and as an aptitude, you should exercise it, they say. I think I have a story to tell. My story isn't even really clear to me at this time. I mean, I want to put words to what my journey has been up till now. My name is Haley, and I'm here taking the TMI workshop. Um, I don't know why, but it's teaching me a new way to write. Welcome everybody to our latest rendition of TMI Project at MHA. It's one of our favorite workshops that we teach. Absolutely. And one of the most wonderful shows that gets produced at the end, so I'm really excited that you all are joining us. TMI Project offers storytelling workshops that culminate in performances. And we always focus on getting people to tell the too much information parts of their story, which we identify as the parts that they usually leave out because they're too ashamed or embarrassed to share them. Morris. <laughs> um, my name is Morris. I think you stole that from me, that line. <laughs> but um, there's two things that you may not be able to tell about me. But, one is that I've been sitting here thinking of all the secrets I have and <laughs> seeing if I'd be comfortable sharing them, and I was, so that's good. I, I was told myself I may have to tone it down <laughs> to be in this group because I have my mind to show. But once, another thing you might not know about me is that I have a master's degree in mathematics. Wow. TMI Project does a lot of work with partner organizations, and we really um, try to choose our partners by focusing um, on working with populations of people who don't often have a chance to tell their story or don't have the chance to be heard by the general public. A lot of difficult stuff comes up for people. Mutuality that people experience in, in the TMI group is a very different aspect from um, the one-to-one -one individual therapy. It offers something different. People don't come to this group because they need help. People will come to this group because they want to express themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I want to be part of this group. You know, <laughs> the part that who re, of people who reveal themselves and tell about themselves. And, and also, I think it would be helpful for me to come to terms with my past and my present. I have problems with clutter at home. And the hardest thing for me might be getting used to talking about myself because it's kind of like a secret mm -hmm. what's going on and mm -hmm. what's happened. So, um, I recently took the TMI workshop at Omega and I loved it. So um, that's why I signed up to have the full 10 week experience. What I want is to have um, a lot of dedicated time um, mm -hmm. to devote to writing and being creative, which is something mm -hmm. that's a struggle for me. So. One thing that when I heard about the MHA workshop, I knew that they had offered MHA to their clients first, and then with any opening open space, people with undiagnosed mental illness could join. You know, it's about destigmatizing and mixed groups, and that really appealed to me. It doesn't matter if you have a, a diagnosed mental illness or you don't. Like, we are all walking wounded. You know, I, I, I've, I always find that. So when people come in, we try to go through the guidelines to set up a safe space so that everybody feels comfortable. I mean, what we're asking of people is to share their 
deepest secrets and to be open about the stories and the experiences they've gone through. And so it's crucial that we set up a safe space right away. Then we go through a series of introduction exercises and get right to writing in the first session. So um, we're gonna do our first free write. Um, I'm gonna hand out these little slips of paper that have writing prompts on them. Um, read all four. For a few weeks, we do writing prompts to elicit new ideas and new perspectives. Um, but they're really here to influence you, to kind of jumpstart your brain. We try to gauge the prompts so that they get more and more personal as the weeks go on. And they are fear, anger, guilt, and shame. Regardless of what prompt you give people, they're always going to write the story that they need to tell. It always leads to the same place. Um, and so themes will arise, and that's what we're listening for as we go through all of the workshops. We're listening for those themes. I hate to brag, but I'm such a slob. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much shame, guilt, fear, and anger at myself and the place where I live. Hmm. So it's interesting that you, you got to that place that you said you wanted to address even in the first writing. Like it, it wants to come out. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Haley, you're up. So I tried to tell a, a, a long story in 10 minutes. Somehow I managed to land a job as the director of special events for a deeply Italian-American social service agency in Brooklyn Heights. My task is to produce the annual Tree Trim Festival, 100 Christmas trees decorated by an army of annoying volunteers. <laughs> the 10 best would be auctioned on stage by the cast of the Sopranos. This is my job. The only way I was going to make it through this experience, this nightmare, is lots and lots of crystal meth. <laughs> <laughs> the MHA workshops are different, and they're among my favorites, because the people in them are mostly really used to talking about their feelings. Many of them have been in therapy. They've been working on their stuff in a way that a lot of our general public participants have not. I remember really clearly the first time that I walked into a mental health association workshop with TMI Projects and sat for the first time with a group of people who all have mental health issues and are all talking about it openly. And it really made me feel like I understood how stigma had impacted me personally in a way that I hadn't realized before because I also have clinical depression and I'm treated for that um, and had never talked about it before. There's so much stigma attached to mental illness and it keeps people living in an isolated way where they feel like they can't share, they can't connect, they can't say what's really going on for them. And so it feels particularly important for us to be doing this work with the Mental Health Association of Ulster County. Mental illness has a lot to do with isolation. Oftentimes, we are a place people come on a Monday morning after they spent the entire weekend alone, and then coming in, having a cup of coffee, saying hello. It isn't just about the, the client going to the appointment and making sure you take your meds and see a psychiatrist every month. We need places to go where we're involved with people. And that's what we offer to people, an opportunity to engage with other people, because that is where the healing works. People who are facing mental health challenges feel that stigma and discrimination. And that's why I, I believe the TMI-MHA collaboration is so important, because people don't know in themselves their stories of resilience and their stories of strength. There are a lot of people who are convinced they don't have a story, and they're very anxious about it. People are anxious about their stories because they're afraid of revealing things, I think. Once you put them at ease, it's really just about getting them to open up and to share and to respond to prompts, you know, that angles of stories that they're not thinking of that will get into their heads and just get them talking. And then they're always excited to learn, wow, I really do have a story. The habit I'd like most to change is dropping my papers and reading material wherever I am. <laughs> <laughs> Allowing huge piles of cookbooks, library books, newspapers, and important mail 
to be commingled on chairs, boxes, my coffee table, kitchen table, and long table in the front hall. I'd like to return these books. Yeah, my stuff owns me, definitely. Uh, oh dear, <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk about. All roads lead to clutter. clutter. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. That's what we need to write about. Yeah. And the details are really, really great. The visuals of what you're mm. letting us in on. I'm getting more comfortable that clutter is my story for now, but I'm feeling that people are really hearing me and it feels good to be heard. When did you recognize that it was clutter? Oh, but that's it. it. <laughs> Now you're reminding me. That's it. I had nothing. When I left my home with my husband, I went to yard sales to furnish my apartment. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I bought everything from furniture to things I needed to clothes to artwork. I bought everything. That's when it started. It first came up during my marriage. My husband was a neat freak. Oh my God. And because I was the way I was, he was like even more neat. It made him more, pushed him more in that direction. I didn't have that much stuff at that time. When we were married, I, had, I didn't have any possessions really to speak of. Uh, a tennis racket maybe. I didn't have anything as a kid. So ah. you never had to deal with like Clutter. No, I didn't ever had to. Room or... No, I didn't have a messy room problem. Yeah, I didn't have anything. I didn't have clothes. I didn't have toys. You know. That's interesting. Uh, it is interesting. Yeah. That feels like a key. Yeah. Why do you hang on to stuff now? Yeah. Because you yeah. didn't have anything as a kid. So that that's unusual. Right. I mean, what what were those circumstances that made it so that you didn't have anything? My parents. Um, were depression people, and they probably, I guess, didn't have anything either. They had a mom and pop store, and all they did is work. And, and we lived very modestly. They didn't spend money on anything, just food. <laughs> we needed to move into a place where my brother and I could have our own bedrooms. So we went from a two-bedroom apartment to a giant house. What happened that made them able to go from having such a little place with no belongings to having such an extravagant home? It's not that we had possessions to fill it. We just needed bedrooms for ourselves. Uh -huh. That was that So it was a lot of space with not a lot of things. Right, and not a lot of people and love to fill it up. Mm -hmm. It was just space. That's an important part of it, Yeah. you know? It's been hard for me to really Process, yeah. It's been hard for me to process what's happened in my life. I, it seems like I've kept it all in. For example, I've hardly cried in my life. I've just gone about my business and really not really processed the challenges that I've lived through. And I, I want to just know what my story is. I want to be clear about that. So in the center of the mind map, you put um, issue you have been working on or thinking a lot about and it can be anything from a halfway through the process we use something that we call the mind map where people will explore a theme that's been coming up repeatedly in their writing and they basically at that point are starting to generate their own personalized prompts that will help them figure out where their story needs to go um, all right what did you have in the middle there? Relationship with my maternal grandmother. Okay. I want to go back. A yeah. um, what do you want that you don't have? A chance to explain my illness. What do you have that you don't want? The memories of my mother without her. My father had predeceased her. It was my grandmother and me. And so Morris, your grandmother came That's how to it live started. with you and your mom? Yeah. How old were you when she moved in? Yeah, I must have been in my 20s, and I got sick at 21, so she eventually had to know. And I have memories of not, her not understanding my illness. Did you and your grandmother get along? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she thought, I just want to make sure I understand. 
She felt like someone you didn't have to explain yourself to. No, she didn't understand my illness, she but she was she was someone I didn't have to explain to. Mm -hmm. She didn't didn't understand the illness. Mm -hmm. But so was it hurtful to you that she didn't understand your your yes, illness? Yes, yes. That yes. was hurtful to you because you yeah. felt like there was part of you that she didn't understand or yeah. didn't accept. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was she, she afraid of the of understanding that, or was it that she wasn't she afraid? Thought, of she kind of thought it was an act. She thought That's you were all. acting. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Like you really weren't sick, that it was mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm, and you should just sort of shape up sort of thing? No, nah, I'd have to write it down. Oh, yeah. I have okay. a particular instance in mind, but I'd have to well, set it up. That would be good if you could do yeah. that. Like, yeah. 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 No, 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 I don't do this. Yeah. My mother, anyone, would keep from me the extent of it, and when the final diagnosis was in, she later told me my father cried. grandmother that time that I won't write about <laughs> that I realized in a way I guess that was just one of the things how uh, devastating a disease could be that was like after my first or second hospitalization it came on long but I could see that something really definite was happening to me What is it about the illness that you would have liked her to understand? Like, mm. if you were going to explain it from mm. your perspective, yeah, what it feels it. like, mm -hmm. yeah. what would you want her or anyone else to understand? That's a good question. Yeah. 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 What, what would you want? I'd like to anyone to understand yeah, what I want yeah. her to know. Yeah. What would you want what was her all about? and anybody else yeah. to understand? I mean, you could almost write it as a letter to her. Yes. That's mm -hmm. yeah. I am. Um, I will write that. For years we were invincible, superior. Love and cocaine made us that way. But now we just bore each other and the cancer shows us we are not true allies. He lists the reasons he's leaving me. For starters, I'm a junkie, addicted to my father's endless supply of Percocet and morphine. I think addiction is a huge part of my life. It's a part of every generation of my family's life. Both my parents were, were addicts and um, I don't consider myself an addict like that because I think I'm a little more actualized, but I definitely, I do dance with it a lot. Emilio tells me he can't stand to see me like this, pale, dark rings under my eyes, scratching myself like an old dog with fleas. And besides, he's in love with my friend, Jenny. He's never felt like this before. At that time in my life, I didn't really have tools to deal with the grief I was feeling. Um, and so the crystal meth was, it's a way out of intolerable feelings. And, um, and so I was obviously very depressed. So when you take crystal meth, you feel happy and the world seems okay. And you're always chasing that dragon. But um, I think it was more active desperation. I had been trying for a really long time to to clean up my acts and kick and kick drugs and alcohol and um, I was really healthy and then I met Marlon and you know and that was my first experience of having kind of like like kindness and love in my life that kind of love made me want to live in the world. So Sari and I have been busy editing your work. Um, and what we hope for today is that you will read it with an open heart and mind and read it as enthusiastically as possible um, so that we can hear what it sounds like because we don't know if our edits work until we hear them. Mm -hmm. um, so this is part of the process. If you read it and this happens and we love when this happens, you think, oh my God, this is exactly how I wanted to tell my story awesome. Um, if we need to work things out over the next week, we will. 
Let's just uh, go through and see how it goes. My mother hides her drinking in the bedroom. For years, we think she talks in her sleep or she's very tired. I grew up wandering the house, not knowing there is anything better out there. In 2000, when I'm 27 years old, my father dies. He's only 54. We learned that he shielded us and the world from the worst of my mother's behavior. Her drinking moves from the shadows of her room, and we start to get calls from her employer, concerned friends, state troopers. Our community chips, cracks, and breaks away completely. We find out that my mother, when she drinks, likes to handle loaded weapons. My sister. I have shame, like everyone has shame, about my family's um, history with addiction and my own struggles with it. Um, but being in a room full of people who are uh, who who have their own struggles that look different and um, and feel the same shame that um, I do, um, it made it okay. It's a lot to take in at, at one time. I feel a little guilty. Mm. Um, Share shame. Oh yeah, is that a thing? Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm reading, I'm thinking, I'm such an asshole. Um, <laughs> and I wonder if it's too much, like, is it too much detail? Like, I think the challenge of the piece is gonna be in the reading of the dialogue. Yeah. And I think I could help you with some of the delivery stuff, just yeah, because it's be, more yeah. of a dramatic one yeah. than, than others. I also want to say that there's there is a lot of humor in here. Mm -hmm. I know you, you, that your first reaction was that it was very dark, yeah. but um, I mean it's one of those uh, stories where the absurdity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. makes it funny, and also your reading of it and your writing. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing I would just say is in the very beginning, and this is for everybody. If you have a line that people are going to laugh at, mm -hmm. just pause after and let yeah. them get their full laugh yeah. out before you cut them off again. <laughs> um, because if you jump right back in again, yeah, their, their laugh gets cut off. And we are going to need as many laughs as we can get, you know? <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Eva Tenuto. I'm the executive director of TMI Project. And I'm Sari Botten. I'm the editorial director of TMI Project. It's hard for us to share a microphone because of the... <laughs> this is our eighth session working at MHA. It is one of our favorite places to teach TMI Project. It's an exhilarating experience every single time. Also, we want you to bear in mind that the stories you're going to be hearing um, and the people who are going to be telling them they're not professional actors, they're not professional writers. These are people coming up and telling you their personal true stories. So bear that in mind as you're listening. But otherwise, we'll start the show. Please enjoy the show. Thank you. In 2003, I meet a sweet and handsome classical cellist named Marlon. He treats me not like a self-destructive floozy, which I am, <laughs> but a secret princess, like the funniest, smartest princess you've ever met. I can't understand, Marlon, or why, for the first time in my life, I am sexually attracted to a man who is kind to me. For a few months, I'm convinced he's a child molester. <laughs> a year or so after marrying, Marlon and I visit my family in Florida. My mother always insists we stay with her. She's fall down drunk when we arrive and spends most of our visit hiding in her bedroom to avoid us, but still we stay with her. Tonight she's on the couch, looking miserable, bathed in a yellow light from the seafoam green lamp on the table, reclining like a pasha in her cream-colored velour robe. Why do you make me stay here when you're obviously not happy to see me? She doesn't answer, just rolls her eyes. Usually this makes me feel invisible, but tonight, something snaps. Tonight will be the night that I refuse to retreat, that I draw the lines of myself indelibly right here in this room. Over and over, I demand answers to the riddle of her coldness, determined to get to the bottom of it. And slowly, it ceases to matter that she won't answer. I'm screaming for myself now. Finally, when I'm exhausted, throat hoarse, disgusted with her and myself, 
She turns to face me. She looks me in the eyes for the first time all night. She looks sad. Haley, she says, I can't do more than this. I can't do more than this. I've been asking her to reach down deep and find the lost maternal figure, my protector, raise her from the dead, and put her on trial for desertion. But this is my mother. She never deserted me. She was never there. And maybe it's not that she didn't want to. Maybe she did, but she couldn't. She can't, because she isn't. It's the truest thing she ever said. My mother was my first love, and I loved her blindly. I didn't receive the love I gave in return, not really, and it was excruciating, a primal mystery I spent most of my life trying to solve until that night. And I'm grateful for that moment of clarity in her because it finally called off the search for me. Thank you. There's nothing in the world like somebody laughing at something that's been traumatic for you. It's really, I mean, with enough, with enough time, it's the best feeling in the world. And it literally feels like somebody just goes, okay, we'll take that. Like, it just feels complete, like a physical sensation of lightness. Growing up, I don't have anything. No clothes, no toys. Our parents spend money only on food and rent. At 11 years old, I ask my mother if I am an orphan. It's my way of saying she's coming up short as a mother, but it doesn't change anything. Now I'm the opposite of what I grew, grew up with. Stuff is all around me. It's everywhere. I, I end up hiring two professional organizers. I'm one of their best customers. The, org the organizers do their job, and then I go to more yard sales. <laughs> I, have, I have a hard time organizing on my own. Last night, I spilled a bottle of over-the-counter medicine. I had to go out, and so I left it there. Sometimes it seems like there is no time to clean up. I want to know what my story is. I want to be clear about that and I want to be clear of the clutter. I want to adopt myself and mother myself. I want to have the love and caring of friends and my own compassion. I'm good about loving people and showing empathy and compassion for others. Now I need it for myself. Oh, performing was fun. And I had friends come to the performance, people who, not all of them, knew my, my clutter secret. And my friends were supportive, and they loved me anyway. <laughs> A letter to my grandmother. Dear Gigi, you were 60 years old when I was born and you were a big part of my life. You died 20 years ago at the age of 96. So much has happened since then that I wish you could have witnessed. When you were alive, I was home a lot and didn't go out much. You didn't think I'd get better and you thought my problem was behavioral. I had all sorts of books about schizophrenia but you didn't read them because you didn't believe it. I wish you understood my illness better. But when I was, but when I was house buzz, you thought I was misbehaving, but I knew it was something else. Still, you always treated me respectfully. I liked that you treated me like I was normal, but I do wish you understood that I was not acting out. I couldn't help it. I remember you cried like how my father cried when he found out I had mental illness. He didn't cry in front of me, but mom told me he had cried. I'm not sure why he cried. It's not like I died. 
I still had my whole life in front of me. Since then, I've become so much more independent. You got to see some of that. Gigi, there are areas where I still struggle. I have a tendency to cry a lot. I find it hard to communicate. I have trouble reading. I get nervous and do things like spill with coffee. I get nervous about TMI. I'm afraid of being judged, judged, but I want to express myself. There are good things too. I like that people like me. I like that I'm getting more organized, I hope. <laughs> Gigi, I wish you could be around because I would have liked you for you to see how, that I got better. Love, Morris. <laughs> I know I ran, <laughs> after I was dead, I ran off stage. I think that DMI is the only way to go about uh, giving my idea about what it is to live with mental illness. Eva Tenuto has coined the phrase vicarious resilience, which I think is, is such an important part of of what's come out of the TMI and the MHA experience together. And I think that um, anyone who has an opportunity to see one of our performances will have an opportunity to, to feel that vicarious resilience. You overcome stigma, one person at a time, one attitude at a time, one family at a time. People in this community are coming to see our shows, they're listening to people and their family members are coming, and it's getting easier to talk about in the open without the shame. Our slogan is changing the world one story at a time. When you hear someone tell their true story, you get to see things about them that you wouldn't just going through the world with them. You can really get a window into somebody and discover that they're a human being. They're not just a set of identities. There are human beings who have human experiences very much like your human experiences. People who may have gone unnoticed because they couldn't say who they were, they couldn't say this is who I am, this is what I struggle with, are now being recognized. You know, I love that when Morris goes out now, people know his story and they talk to him and he is, he's not invisible. He is a person with a story that they connected to for some reason, and people feel inspired by him. Where we're living now with mental illness, with mental health issues, but we're not in secret. We're telling our truth, and we are being present um, for who we really are.